Good morning, everybody. This is the crew. These are the people that made it out during the blizzard of 24. It looks more like Christmas today than it did on Christmas. I love it. No, it, it, it snowed on Halloween and uh, Valentine's Day and today and not on Christmas. Look at that. It's beautiful. Well, welcome, everybody. It's always an honor to get to be up here. It's always a lot of fun to get to be up here and bring the word a little bit. Uh, I just really quickly want to welcome everybody that's joining us online today. Can we make some noise for everybody that's watching online? <laughs> Annie Mills is downstairs with, with our kids, and she's going to be watching later this week. Hi, Annie. Actually, you know what? There is one of my favorite groups of people in the room. Can we make a loud, loud noise for our Real Life Kids team who is serving with our kids today? It's really easy to say that they gave up their Sunday morning to be with our kids. That is time well spent, time very well spent raising up this awesome next generation that is coming up next. So thank you, Annie. So glad that you're checking back in. Um, like Pastor Jim said, this next weekend we have Good Friday service. We've got our Easter celebration happening next week. Today is Palm Sunday. I actually, last year I got to preach on Palm Sunday and also did not talk about Palm Sunday, but I have to say it again. Palm Sunday is when we celebrate Jesus finally, he was kind of like beaten around the bush, making his way to Jerusalem. He finally enters Jerusalem. He enters on the back of a donkey. Everybody loved him, the moms, the dads, the boys and girls. They all loved him, laid down their clothes, uh, put down palm branches, were yelling, Hosanna, praising and worshiping his name. I said it last year, I'll say it again. He smiled at them. He loved them knowing full well that they would be the very ones calling for his torture and death later that very week. We serve a really, really good God. Can I get an amen? amen? We serve a good God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for who you are. Lord, there is no one like you. God, we praise you today because this whole week we're celebrating what you did, that ultimate um, payment for our sins, that celebratory morning where you rose from the day from the grave in order to tell us that you have conquered death and that we get to celebrate that with you Jesus we thank you for who you are for your salvation and God this morning I pray that you would just speak to us through your word and God it's wonderful to be together to worship you in your name we all said amen so today, we've been talking about being close to Jesus. We've, had, we've been reading a couple stories of some intimate moments that people have had with him. Today, we're talking about food. Is anybody hungry today? Oh, we got an applause for food. We're really talking about meals, but I love food. Does anybody else love food? I really love food. And here's the thing. I thought, because I appreciated food so much, I always thought I was kind of a foodie. Like, I wasn't the person that would take a picture of my food, but, like, I really appreciate it. I was talking to Brenna the other day. I realized I'm, a, I'm like an anti-foodie. I'm kind of at the other end of the spectrum where I actually lower my standards in order to put more in. <laughs> like, I'm a Little Caesars guy. It's hot. It's ready. And that is my standard. <laughs> yeah. it's, they, they know what they're selling. But if I eat, I want to leave satisfied. I'm not like making a road trip to a place where I'm spending $100 on two bites of steak just for me to run through McDonald's on the way home. I love food. And you know who else loved food? Jesus loved food. He really did. It's not even a joke. Throughout the four Gospels, there are 13 times that he sat down for meals with people. And of course, we know that Jesus spoke in synagogues a lot. He did preach a lot. But there is a disproportionate amount of time that he is spent around the table eating with people than him actually preaching in the synagogue. Or like, we have a few chapters of the Sermon on the Mount. But we get so much more time in the Bible that we see Jesus spending time with people around the table. And anytime Jesus did something a lot, we need to pay attention, it's important, it's really significant. 
And so here's the mental image that I'm going to be painting today. Can you imagine being invited to Jesus' house for a dinner party? Imagine sitting down at the table that he probably handmade. He probably carved out all the chairs himself. It was his passion to work with wood. But what would he serve? I think he's kind of a funny guy. I think he would serve lamb chops, maybe some rising crust pizza, maybe some hot cross buns. I know Jesus is a jokester. Can we put this up on the screen? He would go to the store and get this sinfully good chocolate. <laughs> and he'd just like put it in the middle of the table and just wait to see. He'd just like watch to see what people did. <laughs> Have you ever noticed how central meals are to the Bible? The Bible begins and ends with meals. The first words of God to Adam are an invitation to eat, to nourish his body. The first conflict in Genesis is over a forbidden meal, at the end of the Bible, in Revelation, we get this final vision of a new world with a massive joyful banquet, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And no one is more associated with those mealtimes than Jesus. He, I already said he spent a disproportionate amount of time at dinner parties, which earned for him actually a bad reputation with some people as a drunkard, a glutton, and a friend of the wrong sort of people. And of course, those first two are false accusations from people that didn't really know him. But the last one, he was a friend of the wrong sort of people. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about in a minute. But Jesus wasn't just partying. He wasn't wasting his time. He did so much ministry around the table. That's how he chose to minister to people. His first miracle was helping fix a catering crisis at a wedding his, lacked, his last act before his death was a dinner around the table with his, uh, with his disciples that spans four chapters of John. Um, the, at the first thing he does when he's discovered by his disciples after he raises from the grave, he sits down with a meal with them. There's a significance to that meal-centered ministry. We are nourished one, we're nourished, our bodies are nourished by the food and drink. And two, our souls are nourished by good company. There is nourishing that happens during meal-centered ministry. And we reflect this as the body of Christ. We take communion together. We, as life groups, a lot of them sit around and eat and catch up. That's what our life group does. We catch up for an hour over a meal before we actually even jump into reading the Bible and discussing a topic together. The strip down Lexington with Panda Garden and Mavericks and Keys Cafe and Caribou and the original malt shop, that's holy ground. <laughs> I love it down, I can't even tell you how much time we have spent doing ministry on that corner together. Why? Because it's not just about the food. It's time spent around a table facing each other, receiving nourishment. It's a holy activity where relationship happens. Meals are a holy activity where relationship can take place. And movies and literature know this. They actually use meals to further relationships or communicate something about the characters in the story. Let me give you a picture. There's a family in a living room lounging on the couches, all doing their own thing on their phones. Dad is reading the paper. Mom is reading a book. The son is playing a game. The daughter's scrolling through Instagram. And they're in the living room. Whatever. Like, do your thing. Hang out how you want to do that. But take that same situation and put it at the dinner table surrounding food. Did anybody's alarms go off in their head? There's something that that tells you about the family. It tells you something isn't all there. It makes me think of like the dad in Elf, who's like, I got a bunch of work to do. I got to finish a ton of stuff. He's trying to leave the table, and it tells you something right off the bat about this family. Even mom and dad aren't engaged sometimes. My daughters even know this. Miriam has this thing where she's always begging us for family dinner, which basically means that we turn the lights off and we eat by candlelight. It could be any, we could be having Little Caesars, but if we turn off the lights and we, and we turn on the candles, Miriam's like, ah, oh, family dinner. 
And there's something about it. It's really funny, but it works. That Little Caesars tastes a little bit better because it's by candlelight. There's something about it. Galilee, too, the other day I put her mac and cheese in front of her for lunch. I went back to the kitchen to make my food. And after a little bit, I hear her say, Daddy, come look. Daddy, come look. And I poke my head around the corner, and she had gotten down from her chair, which was already next to where I was going to be sitting, and she pushed her chair right up to be budding next to mine. Next to each other wasn't good enough. We had to be right together. She's two, and she gets that. Now, as she had gotten down, she spilled her entire bowl of mac and cheese on the floor, which was what I saw first, but it's a process, and it was a win. See, meals are a holy activity where relationships take place. There is something inert within us that understands that. So let's finally get into some scripture. Anyways, let's look at the Bible. Is that what Bruce said? That was like one of the funniest things. Anyways, back to the Bible. Let's get into some scripture this morning. Again, anytime Jesus does something a lot, we want to pay attention. So let's look at what it means to be at his table. There's something special happening there. He's hosting a meal for us. What do we need to pick up on? We're going to start reading in Luke 19, verses 1 through 7, right at the beginning of Luke 19. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus, Maybe you remember him. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Now, here's the thing. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. And a wee little man was he. More importantly, he was a tax collector. Now, if you've read a lot of the Gospels, this comes up time and time again. It's like, what is the deal with these tax collectors? Everybody it just gets so up in arms about them. It's not just because tax is bad. It's not just... Because of that, it goes way beyond that. See, the people in Israel only had to pay taxes to the Romans, to their overlords who had taken the land and are forcing them to pay taxes. So essentially, Rome would approach some of the Jewish people saying, hey, if you can force your brothers and sisters to pay this money to us, then we'll look the other way when you force them to pay more and you keep that. You can do basically whatever you want. It was pretty common practice for the tax collectors to force people to pay way more than they needed to, and if you couldn't do it, straight to jail until you can pay. Oh, and you can't pay because you're in jail and you can't work? Not my problem. That is your and your family's problem. So, needless to say, these guys are not well-liked. They're basically the loan sharks of the Jewish world. So we have Jesus entering Jericho. There's a man named Zacchaeus. He is the chief tax collector. He's not just one of the guys. He's running the show. He wanted to see who Jesus was. This is verse three. Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, wee little man, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since he knew Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once, welcomed him gladly. All of the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. What's going on? And you see this all the time. Every time this happens, he's going to be the guest of the sinner. Why is Jesus such a good friend of tax collectors and sinners? But can you blame them? Jesus This miracle worker, regarded as the prophet, or the man that the prophets had foretold for hundreds of years, he's finally here. Everyone is begging him, Jesus, come eat at my house today. Jesus, I have done my best. It would be the honor of my lifetime if you would come and join me at my house for dinner. But Jesus looks up at this tiny loan shark in a tree. Pastor Jim and I were talking. He's basically Joe Pesci. Up in a tree. He's a tiny guy. He probably uh, just got done locking up a dad of six kids. His robes are entangled in the tree. He says, Joe Pesci, I'm, who probably just locked up a father of six, I'm coming to your house. I'm going to give you the honor today. What? And this guy gets his name in the Bible for people to remember forever? And he gets a cool song? (laughs) 
where's my song about how tall I am? That's what people are thinking. Why? Well, where others saw a sinner, Jesus saw potential. Where others saw a sinner, Jesus saw potential. He said, this guy is willing to make an absolute fool of himself. He's already short. He's already hated because of how wealthy he is. He's getting up in a tree, making a fool of himself just to get a glimpse of me. I can work with that. See, what we learn from Jesus here is that the table is a place of honor. He honored Zacchaeus. Of course, he was inviting himself to his house, but he honored Zacchaeus by inviting himself over. When Jesus invites us to the table, it's personal, it's welcoming, it's exciting, it's honoring to us. There are a couple of words here from Greek that I want to break down. It's dekomai versus prosdekomai. Say prosdekomai. I'm going to be saying that a few times throughout the course of this morning, so I want you to get accustomed to it. Dekomai, if you take off the, the prefix there, dekomai means you're welcome here. The door is unlocked. You're not my enemy. This is your space to use. Pros dekomai, you just add that little bit at the beginning. It means welcomed with honor, personally met at the door, um, excited to bring them in, per personally brought to their place of honor at the table. We see this really, um, really great example of this in Jesus' uh, parable of the prodigal son where the father runs to his son. Uh, this is in Luke 15, starting at verse 20. But while the prodigal son was a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion, and he ran and embraced him and kissed him. This is prostecomai right here. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to even be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet. Bring the fattened calf that we've been waiting for a special moment. Kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For my son was dead and is alive again now. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Prostecomai. Prostecomai. The father is personally watching. He's got all these servants, but he's personally waiting to see his son come back. He runs to meet his son. He's, uh, he's a wealthy man running a lot of, of land. He's probably got robes down to his feet that he would have to pull up and dishonor himself in order to run and meet his son. He embraces him. He kisses him. This gives us an idea of how Jesus would receive any one of us coming to be with him. We pull up to the house. Maybe we're even ashamed to be there. He's waiting on the front step. He's, he runs to us. He hugs us. He personally walks us inside. We, we get this vision of how excited he is for anyone that would accept the invitation as an honored guest at Jesus' table. And there is a place for everyone at the table. Point two, the table is communal. The table is for everyone. It's not just going to be us. This is probably the most important thing that we have to understand. It's not just going to be us. Jesus throws these big parties where everyone is invited. Here's a question. Have you ever welcomed in the wrong people? Which is kind of a weird question. Have you ever welcomed in the wrong people? My parents have this awesome story where um, we used to live up in Moundsview when I was a kid. They were in the process of selling their house. And so there was this Saturday where um, they had a, a, a showing scheduled where they knew that there was going to be a couple coming to see their house. And so I had a friend over. They just kind of like scooted us off into the basement. We need you guys to go be rowdy down there so that we can show our house to these people. And so a couple arrives at the door. My parents run out to meet them, bring them inside. Oh, we're so excited that you're here. Come see our house, all this stuff. Here's the living room. Wow, it's got beautiful maroon carpet. Do you remember that? That's what I remember from being a kid. We've got this beautiful carpet. Here's the master bedroom. You know, we redid all of this stuff. I painted the, these walls myself. Here's the bathroom. We retiled. Uh, the, the, the tub is new. Here's the kitchen. We, it, I put in this table myself, uh, or uh, this island table myself, all this stuff. They got about three quarters through the house, showing them just every minute detail. And the couple goes, hey, you have a beautiful house. We're here to pick up our son. 
<laughs> so they got to go through the whole rigmarole with the next people that came. The funny part was my friend's dad was a realtor, so he went back through and gave them some notes and everything. <laughs> but it's just this awesome story. They welcomed in the wrong people, sort of. I was more just like trying to cram that in because it's a funny story. But for Jesus, it's never a mistake. It's never a mistake for God. There's never an unexpected guest because everyone is invited. It's a place for relationship and laughter and stories. And it's so easy for us to imagine the table of Jesus with the people around it it's easy for us to imagine that the people Jesus invited and accepted the invitation to be clean, put together, righteous, accomplished, perfect, well-accustomed, esteemed guests. Why wouldn't that be the case? Why wouldn't the God of the universe surround himself with people like that? But if we learn anything from Jesus, it's a place it's not also a place. Like, we get to be there, but really the core purpose of it is that it's a place for those that we would consider the wrong sort of people. And who are the wrong sort of people? Back then it was the tax collectors, the sinners, the lepers, the prostitutes. Who are the wrong sort of people today? Who, if you were with them, would you be worried about people from other parts of your life seeing you interacting who, if Jesus invited you over, would you walk in the door and your jaw would drop, seeing that they were not only invited, but they accepted the invitation? So now, who do you think Jesus is telling you to invite to your table? Let's read from Matthew 9, 9 through 13. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew who wrote this book, he saw Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Here we go, another tax collector. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. He became a disciple of Jesus. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why would he surround himself with these people? Why would he defile and expose himself in this way? Upon hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, which basically means I would rather have you love these people than go about all of your re religious routine." For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. It isn't the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. When was the last time you scheduled an expensive slot with your doctor just to hang out and talk? Andrew isn't in the house. He'd probably love it. He'd be confused, but Andrew would love it. But we don't do that. Jesus says, as soon as everyone is fed and healthy, I'd love to sit and have dinner with just you but until then, there's work to do. Who is Jesus telling you to invite to your table? Election season is coming. It's still down the road. There's still time. The world would see a lot of good if we got off of Facebook, invited people to our house, and prosdecomied their faces off. <laughs> Prosdecomai. See, if we think of the table of Jesus as a place where everyone a place for everyone who has already accepted him is coming to enjoy the company of people that they already know, then we're way far off from the example that Jesus actually set forth. Jesus wants to fill the seats of his table with people who may not have washed their hands. They might not even like the menu. They might not be great conversationalists. And they might even be stuffing their pockets with the silverware. Seriously, the people that we can't imagine inviting to sit at our table for the evening, which who is that? What are they wearing? Are they wearing a shirt that says, my body, my choice? Do they have a hat that says, make America great again? 
Maybe they just got surgery and they go by a different name now. Maybe you just saw the racist tweet that they sent before coming to the party. And maybe everything inside you that's angry about lifestyles and choices and injustices makes you want to tell them to wait at the door until that's taken care of. But Jesus is beaming. He's jumping for joy that they arrived, giving them his undivided attention. Let's prepare ourselves to reflect the attitude of Jesus. It's his party. In fact, we get to be the people that he invites to come early and set the table, and he walks us through the plans for the night. We just get to put that towel over our arm and help him make that connection. Let's join Jesus in what he has planned, because what he has planned is huge, because the table is transformational. The reason that Jesus sat down for a meal with the people labeled sinners Maybe he knew that he wouldn't show up at synagogue. They might even be turned away at the door. Maybe he knew they wouldn't feel comfortable just walking into a church alone for the first time. But he knew that if he invited them to sit down for a meal, they'd say yes. Let's finish the story of Zacchaeus really quick. Back to Luke 19, starting at verse 8. After dinner, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord! Here and now I give half my possessions back to the poor. If I've cheated anybody out of anything, and he had, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today, today, salvation has come to this house. Because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man, again, came to seek and save the lost. He didn't come to have dinner at the house of those who were already righteous. No, he did. We see he sits down for a one-on-one -on -one with Nicodemus, but so much more often he's surrounded by the tax collectors and sinners, the lost. And we don't even know what Jesus said. Verse 7 goes right from, I'm coming to your house, to Zacchaeus saying, I'm a changed man. We don't even know what he said, but there's a marked difference between the chapter before where Jesus says to the rich young ruler, in order to have salvation, you have to give away all of your possessions and follow me. That guy hangs his head and walks away. We never hear from him ever again. But Jesus sits down for a meal with Zacchaeus. And over that table, Zacchaeus seems to come to his own conclusion that he needs to give away everything that he has. Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. Because I've restored Zacchaeus as a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. So back to our analogy about Jesus' table. Again, I'm not a foodie. When we sit down to eat, I ask the waitress, what can I have that'll give me the most? <laughs> I want to leave satisfied. And with Jesus, we don't have to decide. Jesus has the best food available and Jesus wants people at the table to leave satisfied, truly satisfied. People are given an opportunity to accept the gift of Jesus. John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst again. It is the spirit who gives life. This is verse 63. It's the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. It is around his table that Jesus brings the understanding of salvation and the opportunity to say yes. He wants them to come looking to satisfy their temporary needs. I'm coming to get food. I want some good company. It might just be an opportunity to wash their hands and feet before going back into the world. But Jesus wants people to leave having found him, the true bread of life who will satisfy their every need. We'll still have the temporary worldly needs. But we can rest knowing that they found true salvation at the table. And people don't have to leave the same way they came. So there is work to do. Here's my last point. Our part in all of this, 
we get to help Jesus set the table. Kind of sounds like your mom. You get to help set the table. (laughs) But for real, the experience we once had being invited to Jesus' dinner party, we were prostecomide, we were the outcast, we got the opportunity to hear about Jesus paid the price for our sin, we accepted, we get to have a part in repeating that process. We get to bring others, introduce them to their place at the table. We continue in the example that Jesus set before us, and it's so exciting. We see this play out in the early church in Acts 2. Jesus has just left the world. He sent his Holy Spirit. In Acts 2, verse 46, it says, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They still went to church together, But they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. What they understood about Jesus was that time at synagogue, at the temple, worshiping and sitting under that teaching is great. It's nourishing to our souls. But they had experienced firsthand that the ministry of Jesus happened around the table. They continued to eat together. They praised God together throughout their daily lives. They were unified by their love for the Lord, and he added to their number daily those who were finding salvation, transformation, restoration around their tables. I want to honor some people who do this well. We've got a picture of the Smith's table from Bluff's church. I remember when they were first setting out to plant, they had this vision of a table where people had written their names, burned their names into the whole thing. It's a story of the testimony of the people that helped them get their vision off the ground. And this is a paraphrase, but this is essentially what they said to us. If we can get people into a living room setting around a table where we can break bread, hear their life story, we can laugh together, we can cry together, then we've got them. They might not come to church. They may may never come to Bluffs Church. That's their choice. But we can guarantee that if they came into our house, they've experienced their place at Jesus's table. So the question I want to leave you with today is who is Jesus prompting you to invite to your table? Pastor Jim already said it. We don't need you to bring 50 people next week. If you want to see Pastor Jim sweat, everybody bring 50 people next week. Who is, yeah, I mean, like, let's go, let's do it. But who's the one? Who's the one that Jesus is prompting you to invite to your table? In a literal sense. The whole thing about Jesus' dinner, that's a metaphor. In a literal sense, who is the one that Jesus is prompting you to bring to your table? And who is ready to find their seat at his Who's ready to be introduced? Let's follow his example. We prostecomai. We welcome with honor. Show them their honored seat at the table. We don't discriminate who sits there. We invite people into transformed living, a life more satisfying because Jesus truly nourishes the soul. So next week, have your kids invite friends to the awesome kids service we're preparing next Sunday. They're getting ready. We might even have parents in the room who are only here because their kids were invited. How awesome would that be? But who's the person that you want to invite and introduce to Jesus' table? Let's prepare each and every one of these seats for the guests that we're going to be receiving next week. You can trust we're going to be out front, ready to prostecomai. We're going to be waiting and ready to receive them with joy and introduce them to the table. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Jesus, we love you. We're so thankful for the example that you set before us. You're always just so unexpected, God. I'm thankful for your ability that even 2,000 years, I can open up your holy book and find things that I had never noticed before. God, there's so much more to you than we could ever know. And Jesus, you continue to invite us even deeper to get to know you one step at a time. Jesus, I pray that you would help us to figure out what those next steps are for us. 
continue to speak to us, continue to give us the courage, the words to speak to that one person. Invite them over. God, you don't leave us alone. You send your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would bring your Holy Spirit in a powerful way into the lives of everyone that is listening right now, Jesus. Walk with us. Bless us this week. Jesus, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen.